So with with that, boss, would you like to bring our man on? You did. Thank you. Boom. There he is. Look at that room in the back. Wow. You got a lot of stuff. Nice. <laughs> How you guys? Good, How you okay? on, man. Good, man. Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, dude. It's Love, a, man. It, Very excited. I was I was I was just gonna tell them I said the first time when I met Ken was in the dressing room because we were fighting in September 21st, 1993. And he had to fight the main event, but he was more excited about this cage fighting with no rules they were going to do. He was telling me about, he says, they're going to lock the cage. You can do whatever you want to do. And I go, Ooh, I don't know. That sounds a little scary to me. <laughs> so, but he was looking forward to that. He was already pa looking past his fight of the night. Yeah, and Boss goes in there and, and, and wins the first tournament. First time he goes in to fight, he wins the tournament. <laughs> wasn't too afraid of it. Of it. <laughs> Dink. <laughs> We've been lucky, we lucky man. How you been doing? Uh, what you been doing lately? Uh, can you bare knuckle boxing? That's the new thing now, right? Yeah, uh, it's it's yeah, you know, it's kind of it's not really new, but I guess it's so old that it's new, you know. Um, yep. <clears throat> I fell in love with it, you know, back when I was fighting when the first UFC and I got the experience what it was like to actually fight with bare knuckle and no gloves. And and understanding of of really the purity of of striking like when you're going bare knuckle man unless it's open hand boss you know this yep. unless it's open hand if you hit you don't hit your target you're gonna break your hand because yep. your noggin is harder than your hand so it really when i saw that i was like man that's how fights should be because it forces people to be more of a pure striker rather than than a brawl and just swinging punches from everywhere I just fell in love with it and, and told myself way, way back and if I had an opportunity to actually bring that type of fighting back to educate the world on what it is to be a true striker, I was going to do that. Wow. And, and, and actually, if you think about it, CTE-wise for brain damage, it's more healthy than boxing with gloves is because exactly the reason what you said, people can't go full to the head because they break their head. So they have superficial wounds. Cuts that they will have, but they keep their brain intact. And that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. How you doing there, sugar? <laughs> <laughs> no, my um, man. My man. That, that was awesome. Us? Ken, since, since Sean just kind of popped on without an intro, maybe, Ken, you should introduce Sean Ray for everybody. Yeah, here's 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 the, here's the sweetness right here, guys. Was, <laughs> and he was he – was, the one thing I know about him when he was posing was the way that he went through his posing. He was so smooth and the shape, he was his muscles were round, man. He looked really good. Really good when he stepped on stage. Thank you, man. I came out, I was telling uh Bob, I came up right behind you, Ken. When that whole UFC thing was going on, I was training in 1993, 94 at Powerhouse Gym in Huntington Beach. So we're talking Tank Abbott. Um we're talking the beginning of uh, Tito over at the Powerhouse Gym over in Fountain Valley um, and a few other guys. What was the little guy that wanted going to jail? Remember the little Asian guy? I think he killed someone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Joe Son. Oh, Joe, Joe Son. Son. He was Joe there every day. I saw him in the gym training. So this little <laughs> tiny gym, yeah, on Main Street, the tiny gym on Main Street in Huntington was right when kind of UFC was taken off. And this is where Akimo, Akimo <laughs> was out there training a lot. And, of course uh, – uh, I know Dan Dan Freeman. You're up, you're up in Northern California, right? Somewhere up in that area. Yeah, Dan was actually my uh, strength and conditioning coach throughout my career. Yeah, Dan was competing for like the USA titles and all that. Yeah, so, he won Junior Mister USA. Say. Yeah, so that whole bodybuilding and UFC thing was kind of going hand in hand for a little bit. A lot of the fighters were working out in the gyms, and so it's kind of sucked us in to kind of watch what was happening in, in the early '90s, and then it just freaking took off and exploded. So I'm a big fan. You already know that. Well, I appreciate that. Also, too, we have another uh, friend, um, and I'll, I'll say him up here, but I actually bounced with him in Reno, uh, where I'm living now, um, at a place called the Premier Club. Okay. And on one night that I was bouncing, there was this guy that came up, and his name is Robert Molini. He was probably about 6'4", 260 pounds, played tight end at Brigham Young University, but he was from Reno. Mm -hmm. and, he was there, and he was there at the club and ended up getting out of control, and I ended up hitting a dude. And I put him in a coma. I shoved his cheekbone up into his brain. And Ramey, Ramey Berninga. 
actually was working with me that night. I know, Randy. Uh, yeah. yeah. You're going to be working with him, what, a week now over in Vegas? He's going to be the head uh, the head judge, and you're going to be – Yeah, this, this weekend. As a matter of fact, I, yeah. ago, I was in Reno. I wish I had known you were in Reno. I was just there for a show um, that was held over there at uh, one of the hotels, the Atlantis. Yeah. It was held over there. But, uh, yeah, Remy, he's a body promoter. So, yeah, I mean, it's all – it all kind of we all cross paths at one time or another, right? I was telling the boys here uh, a week or two ago when I was in Vegas, I ran into Chuck Liddell. So it's really cool to kind of see you guys grow old together. But when you're doing business of fighting and all of that stuff, I was heavy into the whole bodybuilding thing. Yeah, well, I, I, a lot of my a lot of my success uh, was uh, was due to me because I started when I was 13 and I started lifting. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of my success that helped me help me uh, in my fighting was not only just the technical part of it, but I started at 13 years old to really start really bodybuilding and training my body to be not only be big, but strong, big and physically fit. Yeah. Yeah. When was, there, when was your last fight? When was your last fight, kid? What year and when was it? Take us back to that last fight, the last time you laced up. Yeah, I'm um, seven I, I, I now, so I was 52, so that was five years ago. Okay. And I fought Hoist Gracie. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the uh, unseen nut shot. <laughs> I missed that. I, I've, I've taken groin shots before because I wear a Muay Thai cup, boss knows the steel cups, and I never feel them, right? But in this case, when he actually hit me in the clinch, when, when he hit me, it came – and if you ever watch it, it, it's really low. Like it comes up, under, and then up. So when he hit me with it, it wasn't a straight-in knee like you take it, come out like a movie tie, and throw it in, and you take the front of the cup, and it would it would stand to be okay. This one here lifted my cup, and when wow. I lifted my cup, the, all my junk got just pinched. And so I tried to hold as I was hold, clinching with him. I'm literally trying to shake it off, but it's like squeezing my nuts. <laughs> Because when he hit it, it, the cup slid upwards, and I'm like, it was like, and I just finally went to the ground. And yeah. I think the thing with that one that kind of upset the most was that they had an opportunity to literally see the replay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 the guy on the other side, no question, he didn't see it. Um, I went down, Hoist is hitting me, and I'm looking up at him because Hoist couldn't hit hard. I'm looking up at the guy as he's hitting me going, he hit me in the groin. Give me a minute. And so he stops it. And I'm uh, like, okay. The whole time I'm thinking we're going to, I'm serious, thinking we're going to get a restart. They bring us to the center, grab both of our wrists and our wrists. And I'm what are they doing? And then did both of our hands. And I was like, what just happened? And then raised his hand. And I was like, what just happened? Yeah. Like, and so that, I think that last fight, me, I have this, as you guys can tell, I have this, 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 this thing that sticks in me, that's something that's never going to go away, that I never got an opportunity to truly fight the guy when everything was even. Because, like, in the first one, they took my shoes away. I'd never not worn shoes before. So I never got a chance to practice without it. But it, it was really hard for me to get my footing uh, in there when I was trying to take him down. Um, and then the next one, they put a time limit in there. I had been trained for a three-hour fight. I was going with guys every minute. Then one minute goes for 30 minutes and then I would do every 10 minutes and then work for about three hours just to plan to make sure that I didn't get tired. Cause the game plan was to wait them out, not mm -hmm. make big movements in the guard. Cause nobody truly understood that guard yet, yet with the, at least I didn't. So, but I knew by moving too much, I would give him more opportunities. So my game plan was just to smother him, wear him out, put my elbows on his hips, push down on his stomach and make him move. And uh, I felt like it was the right plan. Unfortunately, um, I think it was three days before the actual fight, they told me that they were going to put a time limit in. And, uh, you know, you, you train for that. It's, it's hard to try to stop what you've, you know, trained to do for that time. But why was it your, why was it your last fight, Ken? Why was that your last? Why didn't you come back? Listen, I, 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 and I think a lot of it had to do with pressure. Um, from the outside, not just the outside, but my wife. Um, listen, I won. I mean, won, I mean, a lot of fights in my career. But when you go, you lose seven fights out of ten fights at the end of your career. There's you. You can't make any excuses of why you should be fighting, other than my love for it. I mean, I could have keep fighting till this day 
and the winning and losing doesn't matter to me at this point. It's more about being able to go in and compete right. and, and ask myself every day to try to be better. To me, that's, that's what I love doing. That's what I would continue to keep doing. But unfortunately, the world won't let me do that. Yeah, we talked about that, right, Rick? Uh, the one fighter that had that, he was, lost a bunch of fights, and then he died. He got, he got killed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's to me, that's different than in my case because when you're talking about a guy that's, you know, <clears throat> 0 and 11 or 1 and 11 and fighting a guy that's uh, – or, or a guy that's thir- lost, you know, won 13 fights, lost 31 fights, and then you yeah. put a guy that's 11 and 0 – that's a mismatch. You're going to get a guy hurt because one, you guys older Two, He doesn't have a winning record. So, but someone like myself, uh, who has been in the ring, been against some of the toughest guys in the world. Uh, I understand where I'm at. I know where I'm at. And in any of my fights where I've had, I've always been able to protect myself. And, uh, even in cases where, um, referees stepped in to try to protect my, myself, unfortunately, the way that the sport has changed and I'm, I'm all for it. Because I would rather caution on the side of side of safe rather than not. So I'm not against anything that any of the referees ever did. I think it was all for my safety. So I've never complained about that. Um, but this, but the world is changing. Guys like Tank Abbott, um, Oleg Taktarov, guys that you beat up for 30 minutes and then they turn the fight around and win. You're not going to see that anymore because they're going to stop them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. You know, well, Ken, question, Ken. What, what, what fight you, that you lost that you actually got beat? Um, how that how that affect your mental game? Because I know yeah. I've been beat at fights and it, it messed me up. I mean, how how did how did you overcome that? Yeah, I haven't. Um, you know, I think any of the fights that I've ever had, even when I was a little bit older. Um, I knew what I was capable of doing, but it didn't bother me because I wanted to compete. Um, sometimes I didn't do the best performance. Uh, <laughs> that's what I don't like. I hate not being able to compete at a high level, but I always challenge and keep pushing myself. Myself. I would say the ones that the ones that bothered me the most was the ones like Hoist Gracie. That's the only one out of my all of my career. Anybody that I ever fought, even ones when I lost. Those are the only ones that I felt like I never really got an opportunity to really do what I knew I could have done. Um, only because there was always, and again, it's not Hoist's fault. Hoist did what he was supposed to do. He yeah. didn't cause this to happen. He was in the rain. He got the win. He did what he needed to do to win. But it was all the other stuff that surrounded outside of side of there that bothered me, like taking my shoes away. That wasn't Hoist's choice. Hoist went in and fought what he was supposed to do. They took my shoes away, said, hey, it's a weapon, but his gi's not. Nobody knew the difference back then, but we know now. And then, of course, putting the time limit in there where it was going to benefit him because, you know, the longer that the fight goes, they think he's going to win. But they watched me. They knew I fought a 46-minute fight over in Japan. So they knew my conditioning was good. And so it wasn't even their fault. It wasn't the Gracie's fault at all. It was the actual production that had to come in and say, listen, this is pay-per-view and we only have a certain amount of time in this block that we're going to be able to put this on or otherwise the fight's going to cut off. So they had to put blocks in there and time frames in there in order for this to work on pay-per-view. So yep. you know, it's anything to do with the Gracies are trying to make this bad. Okay. It's just what happened. I'm sure they wanted this fight to go longer before we were fighting after it was, it was after the fight was playing out. I'm sure they were happy. It was a 30 minute time limit, but I just, like I said, a lot of the things that just happened in, in the three times that I fought him just felt like I was spinning my wheels and I never got traction. What about the yeah. pay-per-view? What about the money, Ken? I mean, was the money a factor, a part of your career? Because we can see in 2020 vision when it's all over, some opportunities to make money here or make money there. But we also can kind of see the business of the sport a little clearer because we're not competing. That who's making the money and how, how was it that maybe you didn't get the slice of your pie? When I retired – I was realizing that only the top 10 guys in the Olympia were getting paid. We had 20 some odd guys competing and I saw how much money was being generated, but I didn't see that it was being divvied up properly amongst the guys that were actually selling it. And I was passionate about that because I thought my name is selling these shows. I should be getting a larger piece of the pie. Uh, unfortunately it was at the end of my career that I recognized that. What about you? Did you ever feel shortchanged on the financial side? 
Well, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of go through a process here. Uh, I remember fighting and people going, uh, especially later in my career, and then I'll get back to the beginning of it, where people, um, especially the media, mm-hmm. would sit down and always ask me, so are you doing this for the money? You're a little bit older now. You, you know, you're not as good as you used to be. So what, are you just doing it for the money? And I just kind of laughed. And I was like, don't we all? I mean, like, isn't that why we're all doing it? I mean, like, it doesn't matter whether or not I'm, or not I'm 50 years old or 52 or 49 or 22. It has always been about the money. Yeah, you love what you're doing. You're doing this because you love it. But at the end of the day, you're going to get, you want to get paid. So, yes, it's always been about the money. When I first started out, I didn't have an understanding of what the playing field was like. And, and nobody did. We didn't know what numbers were being brought in. I know in the very early stages, a lot of the money was going out on lost lawsuits. Every city we were going to, they were going to court because right. somebody would come in that wanted to get their name, their name in the person politician. They started fighting it, trying to shut it down because it was popular. So there was a lot of media coverage. So, so uh, these these politicians would start trying to get in front of the news and want to try to make it safe, even though they didn't even know what it was about. Mm-hmm. And so you started seeing a lot of that happen. And so a lot of the money was being pulled away. So everybody was kind of making what they were making and there really wasn't a way to negotiate because you didn't know what kind of monies were coming in, but you knew they were struggling. After a while I was there, I ended up going into WWE uh, after, you know, being there for a while and had to make a decision because the money wasn't right. Um, I had walked away from uh, the bank bank station, went into UFC, fought there, did well there. Money was coming in pretty good. Made a good deal with them in my my uh, last year with them. They had to come to me after that, tell me that they weren't going to be able to pay me what I was supposed to be making the next year, which is what we negotiated. Mm-hmm. And I had to step away on the pro wrestling. Yeah. Well, I thought that was a good transition for me, even though at the time it felt like the end of the world because because I didn't really I had done pro wrestling earlier in my in my life, and it wasn't something that that fired me up. It was fun. I enjoyed it, but it wasn't funny. And so I remember going into that going, okay, I'm going to do this for a while just to see where it goes and make some money at it. And fortunately I got, I got to go right to the top with WWF. And so when I went in there, like I do with every, everything, I want to learn everything I can from the front office to the ring, to training, to what other people are doing. I try to make sure my eyes and ears are open. So I pay attention on everything going around me to learn everything I can. Hey, Ken, there's something I always wanted to ask you about your uh, your time in WWF. And, you know, I, I remember back in the day bringing guys like Kimo and Tito you know, to stage to meet Vince and some of the guys. And there was almost like, you know, the, there was a real fan worship that time from the WWF wrestlers to the UFC stars. And, you know, now, now you show up and you for sure were the guy with the biggest rep in the world at that time. What was your recept? What was it like the first day you walked backstage and you met these guys and, and they met you? Can you describe what that vibe was? Yeah, let me let me close out what I was just saying. Um, sure. I wanted to bring it to a point of what the the pay was like to, to get there. But well, what I did was uh, learning from what WWF was was doing. I knew what the the pay pay thing was. I negotiated all my contracts. I didn't have an agent, so I was doing all of this and I was negotiating for my fighters. And so, I, and so I was just understanding how it all went, gates and, and merchandise and, and all these other things that went on. And then, of course, when I went into the UFC, there was pay-per-view um, and, and numbers and different things like that. So I'm trying to put all this together. And then I leave there and I go into WWF. And that was a huge learning experience for me financially. Yeah. Because what it did, it showed me what we could do with pay-per-view. Because at that time, nobody was getting points. Nobody was getting anything on the pay-per-view. It was just straight pay. So when I went back to fight with Dana, I basically, I basically deal with him because he couldn't pay me what I wanted to fight Tito. And I told him, I said, I'll bet on myself. And he kind of said, what do you mean? I said, I'll take it on the pay-per-view. And he was like, well, we're only doing like 30,000 buys. And I said, you know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do over 100,000. And, and he basically said, well, I'll pay you anything over 100,000 plus a guarantee. So I had my guarantee, which was decent. And then whatever was over a hundred thousand buys, I made some pretty good points. And uh, so the first time that anybody had ever brought any kind of numbers 
into the UFC where you were working and basically betting on yourself what the pay-per-view was going to bring in. And I brought that in. And there was a lot of stuff I was able to learn throughout my career, um, like you said, was when it comes to the financial thing, because as you get into your career, you have to start looking at yourself like you are a product. product yes. You are a person who has to be accounted for financially. And if you get hurt, that product is no more being sold. So you have to make sure you take all these things into account and you have to bet on yourself yeah. and you have to take care of yourself and making sure that you have these things in place. And because there was so much to it, that's when I actually hired my first agent because I realized the more I focused on my career in fighting, especially in the UFC, because it was dangerous. It was something that you couldn't just do halfway. Yeah. I had to really focus on preparing myself and, and being in my mindset being the best fighter in the world, making a name for myself. So I brought in somebody to take care of the financial part of it with what I had already learned and understood. When I first, and to answer your question, when I first came into the WWF, I had actually went down to Canada first and worked with Bret Hart and uh, started trying to understand, even though I had done it when I was younger, this was a whole new beast uh, and a whole different kind of uh, machine that you were dealing with, dealing with. The in there was great. And here I was coming in there, hadn't been in a wrestling ring in five years, six years. And uh, now all of a sudden I'm going to jump into this thing. And actually it was 10 years, more like 10 years uh, before I had jumped into a wrestling ring. And so I remember working with him. And first thing he told me was to make sure that I stopped uh, and, and listened um, to what he was going to say, because it was going to be very important on me listening to what his words were going to be next. And what he said was, Make sure that you don't you don't be a pro wrestler. And I looked at him like, like, what are you talking about? And basically what he was telling me is says, Vince brought you in here because you're the world's most dangerous man. You're a no holds barred fighter. You're an MMA fighter. Don't go out there doing hip tosses and sunset flips and, and work in these programs. You have to go out there, you have to kick, punch, suplex, and submit people. Right. And I remember thinking to myself, Shit, that's just like going in and sparring. Like yeah. I don't knock them out or hurt them. I just go in and spar, spar with them, and I do. And so, really, when I went in the locker room, um, it was, and anybody that's done pro wrestling understands this. They don't trust you. You come from this sport, man. They're looking at you, going, "I don't want to wrestle this guy." Right. Not that they're afraid of you, but because it's going to be a horrible match. <laughs> like, like this guy's going to be stiff as a board, and the match is going to suck. And I remember having Vader my first match, and it was the best match that they could have given me because Vader was a tough guy. And he basically told me, he said, listen, the worst, worst thing happened here is if you throw a kick or a punch and it doesn't land. He says, make sure everything you do is snug and it lands because people are watching you. You are the world's most dangerous man. And if it doesn't look good or it doesn't look real, they're going to boo. Yeah. So I laid him in. <laughs> and that, that, was your, that was your tagline, right? The world's most dangerous man. That's what that's what you were called. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you can't you can't fake it. Had it had to be real. In those matches, when you had the like the match with Vader, is it a one off? Like you have one match, that's it, you don't fight him again for the rest of the year or or the rest of your career, or do you guys take that on the road and, and continue that? Yeah, that's a great thing about working with WWF, at least back then, was that We'd fly into Dallas, and then we would do five shows that surrounded in the outskirts of Dallas in different cities. We'd stay in a hotel in Dallas. We'd drive two hours out to somebody, come back to that hotel, stay there. Next morning, get up, drive to the next state, state two hours away, then drive back to the hotel two or three hours again. And then the last night, we would do our <clears throat> show or our TV show, which whatever town was the main town. So all those matches that we did around the area, five, four or five of those matches around the area, we were working with the same guy that we were going to do the program with on your pay-per-view. Yeah. Nice. That's good practice. I didn't know that. I, I just yeah. assumed you had to have more than just one match. It can't just be one thing. So it's well rehearsed. Yeah, we were fortunate to be able to do that. That gave, that's, that's why a lot of the pay-per-view pay -per and the matches were so good was because we were able to really work a lot of things out when we were doing house shows. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Just learn hey, something. Ken, would, would Vader and Butterbean have been the greatest tag team of all time or what? Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that, was, that would have been awesome, man, because uh, Vader is the kind of the same kind of mentality that Butterbean is, is just, just a tough son of a gun, man. Just, 
Yeah. Just bring it. And, and Vader was the same way, man. He, he just, he loved contact. He, he wasn't afraid of it. In fact, this, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he, believe he actually had a couple fights, MMA fights. Hey, hey he, Bean, he, I was, uh, I, I told you I went to Switzerland over the weekend. And of course, my, my clock was all off. I woke up, it was maybe three in the morning. And then I'm wide awake because it's like uh, whatever time it was here. I found myself on YouTube and I wound up watching your fight with Larry Holmes. I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking about you the whole weekend, watching you and Larry Holmes. I'm just thinking of the generational gap. You know, Larry Holmes beat up Muhammad Ali in that the notorious fight way back at the end of Ali's career. And then there you are fighting him for what, 10 rounds? The 10 yeah. rounds, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was kind of just kind of the generation gap between you and Larry Holmes. To see you actually fighting Larry Holmes was really weird, not to mention I'm all the way over in Switzerland watching that. <laughs> it hurt me the most. You know what hurt me the most was I was a huge Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield. I love those guys. Yeah. Then I watched Evander Holyfield get in the ring and actually mm -hmm. fight. Um, well, what's his name? Uh, he fought the MMA kid. Uh, Vitor, Belfort, Vitor maybe. Belfort, maybe. Vitor, Vitor, yeah. My heart, man. I was so yeah. broken. I was happy for Vitor, but I just like it. It hurt. It hurt me to see this great, this this great icon. Yeah. Fall to the canvas. Evander was the holy field against Larry Holmes. Oh, I mean, you know, when, when Evander got beat up by Victor, it looked like Larry Holmes beating up Muhammad Ali. I mean, you just your hearts. You, you know, yeah. It just, you gotta know what you're watching. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you ever get any street fights, Ken? After you're after you were done fighting, your career's over. Did you ever get any street fights? Um, you know, I I'm glad I'm glad that they didn't have social media like they do now. Because <laughs> I think me and Boss have been in jail <laughs> <laughs> on TMZ a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, but since then, man, I don't. I haven't. I mean, I was a big drinker. I probably did every drug in the world. Um, the orgy, you name it, man. I mean, I, I it was just it was on. It was at the, towards the end of my career because when I first started the Lions, then it was it was hardcore. And uh, but towards the end, things started slowing down. I really got caught up in a lot of stuff. Um, I just went hard. Went through a divorce. My kids were, you know, you know, not they were basically. I was in fighting and trying to fight over in Japan, and I was in a uh, three bedroom apartment with two fighters. Worked on through a divorce. And then I, I hear him lock on the door and then my three boys and my little girl were standing there. And I was like, um, cause I would pick them up on the weekends and spend time with them and, 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 uh, and drop them off and checked yourself into a mental hospital. And, and, uh, it, it, I tell you, man, that just tore me up, uh, to, to see how bad things got. Right. And so, I think around that time, I started really turning things around. You know, of course, I'm with my wife now, who I've known since I was 10 years old. She was, uh, she was 10, I was 13, and her parents ran the halfway house at the group home that I was in. But we've been great friends for a long time, and then we end up starting dating and dating, and it's, what, 25 years now? Probably 17 now since uh, – and it's not because I don't drink. I, I haven't drank for 17 years. It's not like I – meant to do it it's just it's just it didn't never tasted good to me i did it for what it made me feel like um, stay, there, stay there with us ken because that's what we talk about on the show we talk about some of the things we have to overcome yeah. was the drinking a part of the fighting when you were training well because i remember mike tyson mm -hmm. said half the fights he was on he was on something when he was like you know on his, on his <laughs> did it I, I was on something uh when i fought oleg Taktarov. Um, I was literally on ecstasy. Um, now how do you get there? How, how do you get on ecstasy before you get into a fight like that? Well, that was a one-time thing. It was in Buffalo. We went over to Canada, and I, <laughs> I know it's fight day. Uh, <laughs> the party just kind of kept going. It just, yeah, and, 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 uh, and I trained with Oli, and so I, I knew what I could do. I already knew. Already knew. But it, it didn't go the way it should have went because <laughs> – I wasn't where I was supposed to be, but I mean, it was what it was. But I, I've never done that before, even in Japan. I mean, I went out and drank and I partied, but most of the time it was always after the fight. I mean, yeah, yeah. We didn't mess around when it came to getting in there and fighting and doing our job. Yeah. Um, we were focused and, and the team was focused on doing what we were supposed to do. But, but when it was all over, 
Game on. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you get there, Ken? Think about it. Think about when oh, yeah. you started to become a fighter. Think about when you were going for the championship belt. That stuff could have never been a part of your economy that you would drink, do ecstasy, or do anything that would take you out of your contest prep. How and when did you decide, screw it, I'm going to go ahead and have a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, then it's this, that, and the other. Because on your run up, I know you had to be clean as a whistle and you were hungry as a lion, but somewhere you must have decided, oh, I'll take a little bit. And, and then people start giving you stuff, right? And then that works? Yeah, and I was never clean. I mean, like, I was always like a, a weekend warrior, you know? Um, but when it came to training, I was always the first one there. The last one, I would train harder than anybody. Um, I worked my ass off. Um, but I would go out and play. But when I played usually back in them days, it was usually drinking. And, um, and that was it. Um, it wasn't till probably later in, later in the end career where I started getting more heavy into the other stuff. And it was because my, my skills were diminishing. Uh -huh. And it was just a way for me to cover it up and not look at myself in the mirror and face the fact that I'm not great. Um, you know, especially with the mentality that I had, I always, I always competed whether I was walking on the street. Um, and if I was, if I knew I was fighting somebody, I would try to break them before I got, got in the ring. And, and it didn't matter whether it was breaking them or not. And a lot of them say, you can stare me on the lawn, on the lawn. you ain't me afraid. I'm not going to be going. But it had nothing to do with them. It had to do more with me, preparing myself. Because the more I stare at them, the more I look at them, the more I build myself up to be angry, I would fight better. And I hear this all the time when someone says, oh, just get him mad, man. He'll go crazy and you won't, he'll, he'll mess up. That's not what you wanted to do with me. Yes, later in my career, because I didn't have the skills I had. But that's how I went into every single fight was I would stare at somebody, I would get under their skin, and I would build up, up this anger and, and this, this frustration so that I would go in there and there would be nothing because my cardio was good. It was really, it was really, I was strong and my skill sets were good. I had to work on my striking, but I was, I, I was working there, right? better at that. That's why I brought in Maury Smith. But I, you had to, I, I wanted to be mad. I wanted to not like you. And uh, so I felt like that was my best weapon. Uh, other than, you know, physical training and preparation. But just before the fight, I had to be able to put myself in a mood where, where I didn't like Yeah. Hey, Ken, Ken, I remember spending a little bit of time with you back, back in the day. And in line with what, you're, with, with, with what you're talking about now, like I remember, you probably remember Tom Howard. Tom and I were exchanging stories about you yesterday. And Tom sends his best to you, by the way, because he knew you were going to be on tonight. I remember we were kind of all out a few times and you, you seem like you were in a pretty dark place in, in those days. And I, I've always looked at you as a guy who's lived life on both extreme edges, like the toughest of the tough and then the most successful. And then, you know, back, back to the other side and back again. And what's interesting to me today and, you know, the last couple of years we've been in touch a little bit is I've seen this guy who's now in his fifties who visually is in the best shape I've ever seen you in, who seems like he's come fully out the other side and is just, like, happy now. I wouldn't say the edge is gone. I mean, you'll probably always have some of an edge, which is a good thing. But do you look back on that now and go, I was in a rough place? And and how would you compare the you of now to the you of 10 years ago? And how did you get from there to here? Yeah, you know – I think the mistake a lot of people make is looking backwards and and trying to figure out why why things happen the way they happen because we can't change that like i mean that that's just stuff that has happened what we can do though is look back back and look at the things that helped us get past where we were at like the 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 rough that times that you go through and 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 those and the discipline that helped you get back to where you are now uh, I think the education, the learning, um, and, and the steps that you had gone through is valuable because you pass it on to other people, uh, being able to help other people not make those same mistakes. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, man, when you have uh, these young kids growing up in the world today, the way they're growing up with so much focus on them, some of the things that we have gone through and that we've learned along the way would go a long way to keep them out of trouble. Um, mm -hmm. even, though there, even though there's a focus on the social media and stuff like that, 
man, there's just so many things that we can teach these guys. And that's one of the things I do. I do testimonies. I travel around and tell my story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I also do motivational speaking. And a lot of that stuff is basically passing on things that I learned from my father, things that helped me get to be from being in a group home, uh, a punk kid on his way to California Youth Authority with no future, um, and then turn out to where I was a world champion in, 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 the, in, the, in the world of fighting, being able to be able to power on and some of the, the ups and the downs that I went through. And then the biggest thing is being able to share the downs after yeah. I became famous right. and things that the, the pitfalls I fell into thinking that that that's not, you no, know, I could do this. It's not going to hurt me. And next thing you know, four days later, you're laid up in a, in a crack house and right. on the couch with three girls laying around you. And you know, your kids are calling saying, where's dad, you know, all these things that people just think can't affect them, them. Like it's cause I go out and hang out with my buddies and I want to go over here and, and party for a weekend and then I'll stop and I'll go home. Next thing you know, you're doing it every weekend. Then you start doing it on Thursdays. You start moving it back on to Thursdays. And then you start doing Wednesdays pretty soon. It's one day after another day because you're hanging around the wrong people. And so you just get engulfed into the circle of these individuals that you're not, <clears throat> not hanging out with or normally not used to being around. And all of a sudden, there they are. And yeah. you take it out. It sounds like that's kind of what it reminds me of the Mike Tyson story. Yeah. You're surrounded by a bunch of strangers that are facilitating your downfall. Right. What, Mike, uh, Ken, what was it? Was that the reason you kept on fighting to keep yourself kind of in line? Like I did my last fight. I, 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 after seven years, I was drinking so heavy and they offered me a fight. And I look at my wife and say, I'm going to take it. He goes, why? I said, because it's going to force me to stop drinking. You know, because otherwise I can't do it. And I always thought with you because that was in your rocky period. Maybe that was the reason you kept on fighting. Absolutely, because what it does is it brings you back to your mindset of feeling good, like you're important now, because now you're yep. back in training, you got your training partners around you. Now, all of a sudden, you feel important again. You feel real again. But the hard part with that is, is I was such a good athlete, and I did a lot of things good, and I put the work in. I mean, I worked my ass off and worked out really hard, along with great um, – you know, skills, just, just natural skills, gifted skills, God-given talent. And so once you start doing that, you start start slacking off a little bit. And all of a sudden, you're basically going in doing fights with basically just, just your talent. And then it may not bother you for a year, two, three, four years, but pretty soon now you've built up all these bad habits because yeah. you're in there training like you used to train, and you're basically winning fights off of just – regular God-given talent. And then when you start start losing, you go, well, why am I losing? And you try to go back in and train and you don't have those same habits anymore. And you don't have the same people around you. You have the same ones that caused you to keep going in that direction of losing fights. Right. Then when you try to rebuild that structure again. There's, there, it's not there anymore. And, yeah. but, but it doesn't stop you from wanting to fight, right? You keep yeah. going fighter. I've overcome anything in my life so i know i overcome this so you just keep doing it until you figure out a way to overcome it or, or you're just saying okay it's time to stop yeah it reminds me of the movie the wrestler with mickey rourke yeah right? i mean that's that's a that's a real look at what probably happens to a lot of fighters i imagine yeah yeah, yeah. And, and now like i said i i i've if somebody was to offer me a fight in my mind, my immediate response was, hell yes. Yeah. But after I sit and think about it and I, 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 I roll it through my head and my wife in the background is going, you ain't taking my fight. You can fight, <laughs> nobody, you can fight nobody else. I mean, you yeah. start, you start making, you make, you start putting them together and you start going, you start going, that's not a good decision. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, you're never I, gonna I, take I, that out of, out of me. You're never going to take that out of me. Somebody jumps in my face. I could be in a wheelchair. If somebody gets in my face, I'm going to fight them. Yeah. I, I just, that's just me. I just, that's never going to change. I'm, I'm fortunate to not ever like be a fighter like you guys, but you know, I'm, people are always trying to tempt me to get back to where I once was physically. But I know <clears throat> the process along the way of trying to get back to where I once was. I, I would, I would injure myself. I would, I would hurt my. Something would tear. Something would pop because I would get into that mindset. And, and I realized that I'm actually in my fifties, right? 
Uh, as a fighter, I imagine you probably always feel like you're, you're still the baddest man on the planet, but you're just going to move a little bit slower. You're not going <laughs> to be able to After the first day of training, you tell yourself and you start going, why did I do this? <laughs> yes, everybody, you also, start going, and it goes and everybody's whipping your ass and you're going, this ain't fun. <laughs> the guys, Sean and Ken, so much more mature to be able to have that view on things now. Uh, Ken, we're getting a ton of comments on, on what we were talking about a couple of moments ago, like you you out doing motivational speaking and, and testifying. And when you do that, obviously, you have an hour, two hours, whatever period of time you have. There's a lot of people that what you're saying is really resonating with them. So a lot of our people making comments, they seem to be facing a lot of the same challenges that, that you faced. And what can you say to somebody? This is putting you on the spot, so I apologize. But what can you say to somebody, like on a podcast, when there's a couple of minutes left, what can they do to really to turn their challenges around? They don't have they don't have the gifts and the fame that you and Bean and Sean and Boss have. You know, they're like myself, an average person facing tough times. What can they do to start turning stuff around? Well, it's good. To- tough one to answer when you know when you don't they're going through or what kind of situation they're in and they have a support system they don't have a support system they got a mother and father still a grandfather you know, i don't know what the dynamic is but i will say this that that no matter what situation you're in first of all it starts with you like nobody is going to do anything for you um because they can't I remember being in the hospital after I broke my neck um, my senior year. I had scholarship, scholarship. I was in a group home. I was on my way to California Youth Authority. Bob Shamrock picks me up, puts me in a group home, and starts counseling me. Um, I get my freshman year. I play football. I wrestle. My, my senior year, I'm undefeated in wrestling. I'm on my way to state. Um, everything, I did everything right as a kid that was in trouble, moving in the right direction. I go into practice and I break my neck on a stupid move where I got into a fireman's carry guy went to flip me and I went to put my hand out. I stuck my head in the mat, boom, broke my, broke my neck laying there. They picked me up, put me in the hospital, drove me away, put me in a hospital. And remember laying in the hospital and doctor tells us that I'm never going to play contact sports again. Sports is over. You know, we're going to have to do surgery. We're going to take a bone chip out of your hip, fuse it in your neck. And you're done. No more contact sports. So whatever it is that you were planning on doing, because I had scholarships that you're not going to be doing that. And I remember thinking to myself, I got depressed, bad depression. Like my my life's over. Like this is all I am. This is why I became important. Why people were helping with schoolwork. And because I was good at football or I was good at something. And I remember my dad said this to me and it stuck with me through my whole career, through my whole life, even through my ups and downs. When I was depressed and going through some hard times, I remember listening to these words and he said, are you going to lay there and pout about it? Or are you going to do something about it? He says, because nobody, and I absolutely mean nobody can do anything for you, but you, he says, in this moment, you got to decide whether or not you're going to do something about this. Because nobody else can do it for you. And I remember thinking to myself, not the way that he was saying it. He was basically telling me, you know, look for something else to do. Be a counselor, work with kids, work with kids. In my head when he said it to me, and I was like, he's right. Like, this doctor doesn't know me. He has absolutely no idea who I am. He doesn't know what I'm willing to do to get to where it is I want to go. Like, this guy's telling me I can't do this anymore. Like, he can't tell me that. And I remember I took that to heart got out of the hospital, started training two and a half years later after I broke my neck and had a fusion, not like somebody who fractures their neck and goes on and does something big. And then they find out, tell everybody that they got a broken neck. I have pictures where I had a halo on. I had bolts in my head, a chest plate on. I broke my neck where they had to take bone chip out of my hip, cut my neck open and fuse that bone in my neck. So it wouldn't fall off, like be paralyzed. Yeah. So I doing that all the way through my career, I stuck with me because I felt like if you ever, if anybody ever has the opportunity to change their lives, 
and 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 it doesn't matter what you go through. You are the only, the only one that is going to do that. You have to put the work in. Yeah, people can lead, introduce you, give you opportunities, but you got to do the work. Amen. Yeah, a lot of people tell them to broke his neck and come back. You two are. I thought they broke the mold with Vinny, but I mean, you two are made from the same mold for sure. Yeah, I mean, being a wrestler, being a wrestler like Ken was, it's got to be even. I mean, every time you go in there, that neck is involved in it the way that Vinny's was as a boxer, right? I mean, yeah, uh, it, it's funny too because when you're when you're actually in the moment, and all of us know this as athletes, when you're in the moment, none of that stuff enters your mind. Like you don't even think about it. Like you got a you got a, a goal. Or, or something that you got to get done and, and you, you're so focused on getting it done that none of that stuff ever enters into your mind until afterwards. Yeah. That's what makes you great, man. That's, that's incredible. It's a huge story. Freaking awesome. You got any injuries now, kid? I mean, you look like you're ready for a bodybuilding show. Yeah. yeah you look a giant. Yeah. Just, you know, um, that's, I've always enjoyed um, bodybuilding. That's one of my first loves. Uh, I did a few shows actually um did a few shows actually won one show and uh so i've always been in love with it and and even as today like we talked about with with motivation the last thing last thing i want is be in a wheelchair yeah. you know i mean being so something happens to you and 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 it just like it it, it it's it's just it sucks man and i i just i felt like if i was going to put myself in a position to be able to be healthy when I'm 80 years old, then with a broken neck twice, I broke it twice, wow. um, and then being able to have a metal ball on my shoulder, uh, a knee, re knee replacement, uh, broke my lower back where I got metal in one through three in my lower bra brackets in my lower my lower back. I felt like fitness was a big part of me being able to enjoy life after fighting, and so I made a commitment to myself that um, I was going to make sure that I stayed fit in good shape as long as I can possibly do it. And I mean, it'll be a time where I'll get to a point to where, you know, I'll be 70 or 80 years old and it, it, I just won't be able to do it. Well, that's not that old. That's, a, that's around the corner, man. That's not that old. Right? 80 years. It doesn't be 80. Look at this yeah, number. 80, that's 80, 80, 80, 80, 85. That's old. 70 is not that old. Yes. <laughs> I'll do it. We're, talking about, those, we're yeah. talking about those injuries. And we talked earlier on some other shows. With those injuries, did you dabble in those painkillers that people get cooked on, like yeah. cotton, cottons and a morphine or whatever? Was, was that part of your routine? Oh, yeah. I think every fighter, um, once they experience it, it's hard to stop. Yeah. It, it's a lie because yeah. um, I don't know if you guys ever watched the movie Dope Stick. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a movie about um, – it's got, got – uh, Keith, Keith, not Keith or Sutherland, but um, – Oh, I forget his name, but Michael uh, Michael Keaton. I'm actually watching that on Hulu right now. Yes, yep. it, yes. and it really tells you about how the government and the the pharma fought with one another uh, of trying to regulate it because it was getting to be a point to where they were just handing them out like candy. They right. literally were saying breakthrough pain, like there's no such thing as breakthrough pain, right? But they came up with the terminology breakthrough pain so they could give you more. And they say, if you're feeling pain, this means you need to up the dose. So they went from 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams to 80 milligrams to a, to a hand 60 milligrams. Well, that's <laughs> logical, right? Wow. <laughs> you're so, paying and you're hooked. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's because when I started taking it, I actually got it from my wife because she was, she had back pain. She had back surgery. And so she was taking, I'm not sure what it was, but she had probably started. the prescribed dose, right? Yeah, it was, it was, it, 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 just say when I took it, I felt like another person. I'd go to the gym and I was training. I was like, wow. So the next thing I was popping, popping these things, probably when I was 40, 46. And I started popping these things. And before I knew it, I remember driving down the freeway because I had this event I was going through and I was driving there from Reno to Sacramento. And I remember driving through there and all of a sudden my body just started sweating and i started shaking and i'm like happening i mean i didn't know and i remember calling my wife and i said honey i think i'm sick man something's wrong with me and she's like what's happening and i'm happening and i told her you're going through withdrawals i was like what she goes you're going through withdrawals and i'm like what do you mean withdrawals i'm not i'm not taking anything 
And it was literally because I took it for almost six months, right, to go work out. And then all of a sudden I just stopped. I felt like, okay, I feel good now. I'm going to stop. I had no idea what the side effects were. Right. And all of a sudden I'm driving down and this hit me. And I was like, and then I had to start taking them just so I didn't go through withdrawals. Wow. Well, then I had to go to this, I had to go through a program to be able to teach me how to be, how to be able to do that stuff. And I thought to myself, how many people have been tricked into the same situation I was tricked in? How many? Really? 60 year old women, 80 year old women. Yeah. Right. And you're just like, you didn't want to do that. You just felt like, oh, they're telling me it's okay. Doctor's giving it to me. It's got to be okay. But then they don't tell you about all this other stuff that you're going to have to do when you want to stop. Yeah. Kind of sounds like what happened with Michael Jackson. Um, it started as a sleeping disorder. And the next thing you know, he's, you know, he's on it all the time. And you hire your own doctor and he <laughs> took him out. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, that, it's a, that's a mistake to hire a doctor. <laughs> yeah, right? if, your friend, if your best friend is your doctor, you know what's going on. Yeah. Hey, uh, Ken, you um, b- before we let you go, I mean, we get welcome to stay on. We, you've been amazing. You've mentioned your wife a few times. So I wanted to give a quick shout out. I hope you don't mind. I wanted to say hi to Tanya from all of us. And uh, being, I don't know if you've met Mrs. Shamrock before or not, but she's very much like like the Libby of the MMA world. Uh, Ken, I don't know if you know Bean's wife, Libby, but just like salt of the earth and cool. So I met her. She was with him. Yeah. She was met him at, with him at a signing. I met her. Yeah. 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 Right. All right. I got one little quick story to tell about my bidet. Y'all got to hear this. Oh, we got his bidet, Ken. <laughs> I, got, I just got a bidet like a week ago. My butt cheeks just crinkled up. I know. <laughs> <laughs> My my four, my three year old granddaughter is still in the toilet with my wife. She goes, "What is this?" So she tells you what it's for. So when her mom comes in, she hall- hollers at her mom, "Come in, mom! Come here! Come here! Come here! Look! Look! You see that? That's what Pop wipes his butt with." <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I, I can't I got this voice. Just yeah, out of right. You know what this is? It's actually a magazine. I know you guys remember what these were, right? Yes. It's been a while. Uh, they've, they've gone the way of the eight track, but I managed to to squeeze myself into the magazine one more time. So That's there it is. Nice. You're a beast. Twenty years, 20 years into retirement, it's still going on. You're a beast, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where, uh, where you guys have been? So what do you got going on now? Like, where can people see you? I know you say you do motivational speaking, but is there a routine that you got set up? Is there a website you have or a social media that people can kind of follow and see what you're doing? Or yeah, you're yeah. Site. What's yeah. Two, I got two websites. One of them is ValorBK.com, which is the Bare Knuckle League we're doing. I know that we've got some opportunities to do some stuff uh, with some people over in England. We're looking to do uh, some uh, promotions between U.S. and Canada, or U.S. and England, having fights with U.S. fighters and and uh, England fighters to to put on a show. As a promoter, you're promoting. promoting. So we're looking at maybe something like that down the road. Um, but uh, if you want to check it out and kind of see what we're doing, um, it would be ValorBK.com. My website is KenShamrock.com. Um, go on there. It's got all my social media platforms on there and all the upcoming events that we have going on with different motivational speaking or signings. I know next week or two weeks, I'm going to be in Vegas uh, doing a signing down there. So, um, yeah, so I got, like I said, I try to stay busy. Um, you know, I think that that itself for me, um, staying fit and staying busy and just making myself relevant um, because I, I, I just, you know, when you live a lifestyle like like most of us has lived, uh, where you're promoting fights or you're fighting, um, it's an exciting life, man, and it's fast and it's 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 fun and exciting, but it slows down, and yeah. I'm not ready to slow down. <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> so, that is awesome, Ken. It's really it's so good to see you like do, looking so good and doing so well. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's heartwarming, man. It sounds a little corny, but it is. Uh, are, when are you going to be in Vegas? What, what's your What are your dates for Vegas? Are you, and are you getting to LA at all? Yeah, I've, uh, I'm going to be in LA. I believe uh, I've got my my uh, 
my uncle passed away, so we're supposed to go to a funeral uh, the November 8th through the 11th. I'll be in um, Southern, Southern Cal, uh, LA area. Um, and then on the 13th to the 14th, I'll be in Vegas doing a signing. Hey, well, Ken, I got, one last, I got one last question for you, Ken. Is there someone you wanted to fight that you didn't get the opportunity to, to go heads up with? Was there, was there that one guy that you just you wanted, but you didn't get around to it? Well, it, it, I get asked that question all the time, and I give you the same answer. It's not somebody that I didn't fight. It's when I fought them. And uh, it would be Tito Ortiz. I felt like I fought him when I was 46, I believe, something like that. And uh, I just, I respect the guy. He's a great fighter. I just wished I, I, you know, it's that, that thing you have in your mind. You just, man, I wished I would have been able to fight him when I was younger because I believe we would have put on a hell of a fight. We'd have tore the house down. I, I think that would have been a, just a great fight because of the way he fought, the way I fought. Uh, I thought we would have just put a hell of a fight on. So that fight happened late, too late for you. If you wanted it earlier, that would have made Tito younger. I mean, that's you know, I mean, just being around the same age, around the same age, prime, being able to fight one another with the same skill sets, not one being more than the other. Oh other. yeah, right. And be able to just because you know, like God, if I, my boss knows this very well. If I had just had more experience, but I just had a little more time, you know, and it's just something that just you just wish. You're happy for them, right? I mean, you, you, you're happy for them. And I respect Tito, you know, and I like him, and I'm happy for him. But in, in your heart, you just, you just go, man, I would have given him a better fight. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fair enough. It, it, it's been amazing you ha having you on today, Ken. Thank you so much for, for taking your time. And, uh, Boss, do you want, to, uh, you, you want to do the outro for our good friend, Ken? Well, the, the good friend, Ken, he put my career <clears throat> in an uh, – <clears throat> In a rocket move upwards because he made me lose. I lost okay. twice to him. Yeah. And the last time I lost to him, I got really fed up with myself. And I told myself, okay, I'm going to have to learn this game. And that's when I flipped everything. I said, okay, I'm going to do striking. The only thing I'm going to do is two times a week, my pads or three times. And the rest is only ground. And it, it inspired me so much. And then I saw all the combinations and everything that you could do with ground fighting. And suddenly I won my next eight fights by submission. And that's when I never lost again. And it all is to that big man right there who sent me on the course. He made me lose in a bad <laughs> way. <laughs> wait, wait, boss, where were those two? Where were those two fights held? They were in different venues. And how far apart were they? Uh, they were not that far apart. I think a year and a half or something, right? Apart, I think. Not yeah, that think crazy. We fought, we fought about about almost four months from each fight. But where were they? Where were they at? Where were they held? Japan. Oh, Japan. Yeah, they were both in Japan. Yeah. So that was, not, that was not UFC fighting, though, right? That wasn't UFC. No, no. What was it? No, no. that was Pancras, where we actually started at. Um, that was uh, Boss came in the very first Pancras event. I was the main event of the very first Pancras event. Boss, Boss, when he he fought, um, who was it? You fought your first fight? Yeah, Aji. You know he's oh, great kid, and, and Boss. I mean, everybody, after that, Boss was a superstar. I mean, when he hit this kid, man, he shoved his face up into his brain. I mean, it was brutal. <laughs> and, and and nobody knew it because it was the very first time that anybody ever actually saw a pro wrestling uh, match that was real. That's basically what this was. They were selling hybrid pro wrestling, and they said, okay, now it's going to be real. And so when Boss came in and hit him with that open hand strike, man, it was everybody. And that, that point on, he put everybody on notice. So that fighting is not UFC fighting. No, 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 no. no but it was real. <laughs> it was real. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of guys from that organization, because they had certain rules that made it more interesting. I truly believe they should bring it back, actually. But what happened is that you know, I think we had like from Pancras, maybe like six or seven UFC champions came from there. Yes. You know, and it was a small organization, so these guys were fighting. We. I mean, we fought the first year. I fought nine fights and the second year, eight fights. I mean, we were fighting almost every month. So we just kept on fighting. If we're not injured, might as well compete, you know. So we learned a lot in a short amount of time. Yeah, Can I fought three we, times in one month. Were you there, Ken, when those fights, did, they had no time limits? Were you When you started, were you part yeah, of that? 30 minutes. Yep, I fought 46 minutes in Japan and then 36 minutes in the UFC. 
Holy shit. Yeah. And in Japan, when we when we arrived there, that's when I found out there was only one round. And I was very happy to hear one round, but then they told me it was 30 minutes. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good time. Yeah, that was a shocker. <laughs> hey, Ken, yeah. Ken, do you keep in touch with any of the uh, the guys? Are you, I know you're in Reno and you have these autograph sessions, but are there any of the guys that you keep in touch with? Like, as a bodybuilder, I'm still traveling around. I run into guys, and that's when we can maybe catch a bite to eat or have some conversation. But is there any guys, main guys, that you kind of have stayed close to throughout the industry? You know, I, it's weird because as you know if it's me, or, or it's got to be me, but it seems like I get so caught up into what I'm doing. Like I went to pro wrestling and I focused on that and I did, I don't do a whole lot of other stuff outside of, of what I'm doing at the moment. Right. I mean, my family or, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing uh, for my career. Uh, I see people when I travel, like I just saw Trey and, and Guy, those guys up there about three months ago when I was going through Dallas um, I see a bunch of people, people when I'm out and going other places, but it's not like I pick up the phone and call and talk to people. And I think in some cases I might hurt people's feelings. Um, it's not on purpose. I, I, I don't know. I hate phones and, and I, I'm not a talker when it comes to like dialing and talking to people. Um, I'm just not one of those people. And I think that maybe sometimes I think people who I was close to for a while when I was going through all that training, might have taken offense to it because I don't contact them or call them or they may call me and I miss their call. Um, so like I said, I'm, it's not like I do it on purpose. I just, I don't know, man. It's, I'm not I'm my best, my best, best wife. The person I go out with is my wife. People I hang out with and I go and do things with her, with her, my kid, my wife, my family, my father-in-law, mother-in-law, my mom in Modesto. When I travel, when I do something, it's usually in that form. And yeah. it, to be prior to that, I was out with the boys and I was out doing other things. But my life is I focused on changing my life uh, to where I'm, where I'm focused on my kids because I missed a lot of that, you know, being a fighter and traveling a lot and uh, and spending time with my wife and my family and my family. Oh, that's when I get a free time. That's what I do. What about acting? No acting? I know Boston a little bit of acting. Are you Hollywood hasn't called you? Can't stand it. <laughs> no. Can't. And, and it's much sitting around like we'll sit and shoot this thing like a hundred different ways. It's like, it's like, dude, we always twice. Well, we got to get his face. We got to get your reaction. Yeah, right. Reset, it's set the lights. And I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a lot. Yeah. Well, Ken, man, thank again. Thanks so much. And keep doing what you do, man. Inspiring, inspiring. Really like great. you do with Boss Wooden. <laughs> keep making people better, man. It's so, so good to see you. Hey, yeah. thanks for coming along. I appreciate that, boss. Yeah, I appreciate that, boss. But um, I think that uh, boss is one of those kind of kind of people. When you look at him, you could already tell he was a superstar, and that he had a lot to learn, and that he was going to do it. I mean, he was disciplined. He was disciplined. Fun. Don't get me wrong, but he you could tell every single time he came came back and fought, he was getting better. Well, listening to both of you guys talk, I mean, you guys are both educators. You guys are both teachers. Like, you guys would probably be great coaches. I'm sure you've helped some people along the way. But with your experience that you have and being on the high side and on the dark side and coming back out on the bright side, it sounds like you guys have a lot to offer for guys that are coming up behind you that you can save them a lot of heartache and some trouble with your experiences. So keep on teaching, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate yep. it. Thank you. Thank you. Right a pleasure always, my friend. Good seeing you, brother. Yep. Yep. And Rick, good seeing you again too, brother.